I think we, we are going to start soon. Um, but before the main event, I want to go over a couple of administrative uh, items in uh, Hyperledger Identity Working Group. The first thing is we are um, bound by the antitrust policy of Linux Foundation and hence um, anybody who is joining this call is expected to abide by that as well. The details can be found in the uh, agenda. The second thing is we have a code of conduct which says that we uh, treat each other with respect even when we are disagreeing with each other or even when we are agreeing with each other. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, please respect the other participants and uh, treat them as you would be treated yourself. So before we start, I mean, I, it looks like uh, there are still uh, people coming into the room. Uh, you know, there are already 14 participants. Uh, so I would rather wait just one more minute. And I see some familiar faces, some uh, who are not familiar. Uh, in any case, I'm going to talk, I'm going to drop the agenda link in the chat so that people can put in their names on the um, on the meeting uh, notes as having attended. Uh, so that's important because uh, we want to keep a track of uh, people here. I mean, you know, if, of course, if you don't want to be uh, on the on the list, please uh, let me know. Um, anyway, so I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome Rebecca or Ribby um, Aspla. I think I'm saying it right. I hope. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and she is here as a uh, project a director of project management from Unbound. Unbound is well known for uh, being the pioneer in MPC because Yehuda Lindel, who I uh, occasion to listen to, did present, uh, you know, in several uh, contexts, uh, the uh, greatness of MPC for um, custody and transfer of assets, especially in an enterprise setting. Uh, but I believe uh, it can be useful also uh, in other settings because it allows some amount of uh, delegation and um, so Rivi is going to talk uh, about many of these aspects. You got the email. So uh, let's welcome Rivi uh, to do the presentation and uh, hopefully she'll uh, share her slides and uh, we'll get to uh, record it and make it available. Thank you. Thank you, Vipin, so much for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Rebecca, the abbreviation is Rivi. Uh, so as you feel comfortable, I'm uncomfortable with both. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to join. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I hope you will find value in this presentation. We will, of course, share it afterwards uh, in an offline manner. Uh, I'm sure we will help me understand how I can share it with you guys. Um, and uh, assuming that you do see the slides, I will begin, if that's okay. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, so I can I'll see be moving it. on. Okay, yep, we so can see I'll it. Be yep. Moving on. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll be moving on to a presentation mode. Uh, and I do apologize, I'm working uh, from home as most of us, I think, are these days. So there will be background noises. I do have a dog that is often barking. So you know, apologies for that in advance. Uh, so we'll focus today on IoT ecosystems, uh, specifically blockchain type of IoTs, because there are different IoT ecosystems. And we'll talk about the challenges that this specific ecosystem is uh, uh, working with or is challenged by, and how MPC could solve these challenges as opposed to, say, I would say, uh, different methods. Um, but firstly, very briefly, I just two slides, I think, about Unbound Tech. I'm very privileged to be working uh, for these guys. These are Professor Yuda Linda and Professor Nigel Smart. They have been uh, the co-founders of the company. Both of them are academia people. They have been working about uh, or of multi-party computation for the last 30 years. So that's quite a lot of, I would say, a long time to work on something and have been able to get through a performance type of um, a breakthrough about six years ago, being able to shorten the performance time of multi-party computation from minutes time to milliseconds time, therefore opening the door to applicative, I would say, usage of MPC. Their initial idea, by the way, was to uh, secure airplanes with MPC. But uh, we found together for the last six years that the use cases are various, numerous, uh, starting from, you know, even uh, uh, creating a VHSM, a virtual HSM, which is more secure than a hardware HSM, going through code signing, protecting digital assets. And today we'll focus specifically on the use case of blocking, specifically IoT kind of ecosystem. Uh, Unbound, this is uh, its brief history. I wouldn't dive into this today, just to let you know that uh, we've been around for about six years now, growing day after day, uh, very proud of the type of customers that have trusted their assets with us, whether these are data assets or financial assets. Uh, we have customers such as Teddy Bank, Goldman Sachs, IBM, uh, McAfee, these are just a few of the names that I can mention, Liquid in the blockchain uh, area. Uh, there are many more names that cannot be disclosed, but uh, we're very proud of our enterprise-grade type of customers. One can only imagine that these types of customers run through uh, very vigorously, I would say, pen testing and, and security checkups before they sign with any type of company. So uh, although the product is rather new, as, is, as in, uh, has been out there less than 10 years, uh, the technology is very much trusted by those enterprise graded customers. Moving on. Oops. So now we dive into the stuff, no more, I would say, marketing of the company itself. So behind the scenes, MPC, and this is, will be the um, uh, foundation of our talk today, and we'll see in a minute why. So behind the scenes, MPC is pretty much taking a key, pretty much, it's not that simple, uh, but it, it's pretty much taking a key and generating it uh, from scratch in a distributed manner. So the key does not exist as one entity all over its life cycle through generation to usage to suspension to revocation and the number of shares could be unlimited in this very simple example we could see five key shares you could see that the key shares could be on any type of device could be mobile device could be a laptop could be a server we're platform agnostic we're device agnostic and therefore the possibilities you can start imagining what you can do with such i would say an ecosystem of um, multiple key shares that could be leveraging their power together to sign one transaction. This transaction could be signing data transaction, financial transaction. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. The whole thing is that the key does not exist as one entity. This is uh, evolution-wise representing, I would say, the next step as to if, if one would know with blockchain specifically for the context of this call, starting with one key that was once kept or still is kept in HSMs, moving on to multi-sig, which are multi-path keys shared with uh, different parties, but with their full manner keys, full entity keys, 
onto MPC, meaning key shares, and it is not me saying so, but actually Gardner is saying so, that MPC is going to be the uh, main, I would say, best practices type of uh, security means uh, in the next five years. So for blockchain applications. So this is really interesting, not my words, but actually uh, Gardner's words. Now diving into IoT, uh, and specifically blockchain IoT, so this is where we'll start diving more into the details. So the starting point, of course, is the fact that we're surrounded by these wearable and um, uh, devices that are sending data and receiving data all over the place. Uh, there's a projection of 10 billion or more devices coming online in the next four years uh, and, and lots of data flowing around all over the place. Now, this is, big, this is very different from the situation uh, there was 10 years ago and certainly from the situation that will be 10 years ahead. Uh, this is interesting because many of the devices that are out there already are brownfield in the sense that they operate with very minimal power or uh, processing power. Uh, and still one has to secure them or rely on them once uh, trying to operate. Now, obviously attackers will exploit and are exploiting these, I would say, vulnerabilities. Uh, and here are just you know, a few examples of what you can do in order to attack an IoT device. This is not the focus of our talk today, the vulnerabilities themselves, but the way to protect them. But you can see here different types, and I think this is the important thing maybe to emphasize various types of security vulnerabilities that an organization or a blockchain infrastructure of IoT ecosystem must take into account when uh, designing such an infrastructure. Now the type of uh, uh, protection that you need uh, could be defined using these four types if you could look at it. So you have uh, the need to secure the devices themselves, the hardware, you need to secure the uh, com communication between the devices, remembering these devices send uh, data from one to another, specifically in the blockchain use case where data should flow between each peer to another peer. There's of course the secure cloud where data goes on to and from to and from to, uh, the cloud to the device itself. And of course the lifecycle management of the data itself. Now, the little key icons were not actually on the original image that I have found. You can see the IoT analytic source, uh, credit is to them. But interestingly, many of these uh, uh, security, I would say protection uh, requirements do require a secure key to be able to work them in a secure manner or move them around, move data, secure data, whether it's data at rest, whether it's data at transit, whether these are authentication of the devices themselves, uh, the identity of them, or whether these are authorizations of messages moving around from uh, one device to another device, to the cloud, to servers, wherever it is. Now, how these keys are being protected today? Uh, this is becoming more interesting because uh, today, uh, most of the IoT devices don't have secure elements. You can actually distinguish between weak IoT devices and secure IoT devices. Interestingly, I don't know if you recall, a few years ago, there was a very interesting attack on uh, one of the largest hotels in Las Vegas. I don't remember its specific name. Uh, and the data of the various gamblers, etc., was stolen, or a lot of data, one can imagine. And interestingly, the way that they got to the IT, to the servers on which data was, was through the terminators of the, um, where do you keep the fish? I don't remember just now the words, like those big fish tankers in those large uh, Las Vegas casinos. So uh, those terminal meters are weak IoT devices for that matter. And uh, uh, the hackers were able to reach the cloud servers, the data, I, the IT and the data of the various gamblers uh, and the casino data through the terminal meters of these fish tankers. So we can see that there are weak IoT devices and these are actually the majority of them. And there are, of course, the secure IoT devices, but the ecosystem is the one that we should care about because 
wherever you go into a home, a city, you have to deal with both types. Now, uh, the weak ones don't have secure elements. Uh, they're actually working on very low batteries or very modest processing uh, power. And their uh, battery is expected to last at least two years, so you don't have to replace those. One can imagine how difficult it would be to replace batteries all over cameras, for that example. So uh, one would have to create um, a cryptographic type of security that is powerful enough, but then again, uh, not heavily consuming processing power. Now, this is uh, very interesting as the fact is that uh, currently obfuscation, sorry, techniques are considered relatively weak, so one cannot use those. But the strong algorithms are actually the ones that today usually need more processing power, uh, which is not the case as one can see. Uh, as mentioned before, many of these also have uh, a brownfield kind of uh, equipment out there, meaning they don't even have any uh, thing to work with, cryptographically speaking. And uh, one would need to sign transactions, sign messages, uh, decrypt data, encrypt data. So the challenge become, I would say, becomes more uh, apparent. Now, IoT blockchain use cases, uh, quite new for the last five years and becoming more and more uh, apparent in the market. I didn't put here any market slides as far as the, what the market is uh, adopting, but interestingly, Gartner has found that uh, there's an 80% growth, CAGR, year over year of the IoT adoption rate. This is very interesting. It's very similar to the ones that we see in the digital assets area. Uh, one can imagine the fact that cars are being very much driving this industry, even though a lot in the lab, but still cars and all the equipment around that. Uh, so here you can see that there are two types of uh, ecosystems. One is the centralized IoT system. And one can say this is not really an ecosystem of blockchain because it is centralized, but we'll see in a minute that it is uh, in those private blockchains. The one that we tend to consider a real blockchain is the fully distributed one, meaning peer-to-peer, -peer, no central server. But what we see is the fact that you have these various types of blockchains. So of course there's the centralized one, which is not a blockchain. This is a centralized database somewhere where we all know these, uh, these are the typical organizations that we all work with. Uh, there's the decentralized and of course the distributed one. Today we're going to focus mostly on this one because this is what we see with the enterprise grade of customers, meaning they do need blockchains because they are creating ecosystems where they do work with customers, with suppliers, with service providers, uh, with partners and consumers, and therefore they need to be able to move data and approve transaction and authenticate devices uh, between various types of them and, and certainly a lot of them. But it's not a fully peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, ecosystem, but there is a central server somewhere, wherever it is. And still there's, uh, of course, several cloud servers that do create like a magnificent, mighty database, blockchain enabled, so the data is shared in an anonymous manner between uh, the various types of mini ecosystems. So let's see a few examples. So a smart home example, of course, all of us has, uh, have or will have smart home type of environment where we have inside many IoT devices. So it could be even the shades, uh, the light, of course, uh, we talked about thermometers, uh, air conditioner, etc., garage doors. So there's the ecosystem within the house of various types of IoT devices that have to communicate with each other. There should be, of course, an in-home server. One can imagine that these are different manufacturers, of course, and still the data must flow securely between the various types, regardless of the manufacturing, I would say, party. But you can also start imagining the additional layers of ecosystem. So it could be in in-house, in building, in complex. You can imagine like um, Bosch, for example, as a manufacturer requiring data from all the laundry machines in a certain location, in a certain complex, in a certain country. 
Uh, you can think of consumers uh, exchanging data between them, let's say, to get recommendations on a specific cloud permission, etc. So the security challenges would uh, involve provisioning authentication, protecting data address, data transit, and of course, transaction of data, proving data between uh, various types of IoT devices, or even you know, turning on, turning off different devices, etc. Examples of what could go wrong in this case would be several. Uh, open the door, safety-wise. One can imagine what could happen if he is at home and someone is able to. Privacy, you do not want to share the data with someone you have not approved sharing the data with. And uh, even less, but less, uh, I would say, frightening, but still uh, concerning, uh, is, is energy. Turn on and off. Let's say you come home and everything has been turned on. Uh, it may not be scary for the first time, but maybe for the third time it is, and certainly uh, a waste of energy. Any questions so far? Moving on. Another example, this is a smart city. This is a more complex example as far as uh, what could go wrong. Uh, I think some of the examples within are probably outdated. They have their own use cases. Still, the connectivity, parking, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, pollution. Uh, there has been, even just a few uh, months ago, uh, I'm, I'm in Israel, by the way, and there has been attack, an attack which no one really knows where it came from, one can only guess, on the water supply of Israel. So uh, someone messed up with the water supply coming in to uh, most of the Israeli homes uh, from, I would say, one lake or one source of water. And the, uh, the amount of fluoride that was uh, injected into the water uh, uh, had been, had the attack had been successful, would have been dangerous to consume simple drinking water. So this is not anymore like, you know, just uh, saving energy, but could really be uh, quite dangerous if, if one could know where to mess up with the data. Uh, you can think of train going out of uh, function or going uh, uh, much faster than they should. So many, I would say, dangers that could be uh, inflicted on various IoT devices. The ecosystem here is again very interesting blockchain-wise. You can think of the various types um, of IoT devices. Uh, you can think of the areas that would uh, collaborate on data. Uh, you can think of manufacturers all around the world uh, trying to get data, let's say, from a specific type of truck, doing something, uh, so many things to analyze. Uh, a whole different kind of use case, but uh, analytics of this. Uh, but this is really interesting and, and starting to gain momentum. And this is something that uh, Unbound has been fortunate enough to take part in uh, without close, disclosing too much data. But this is a, a public slide of Toyota, uh, which has its own blockchain lab and is building something really cool in the sense that they're building an ecosystem of uh, manufacturers, service suppliers, dealers, retailers, and consumers to be able to consume, share data, and work in a blockchain environment uh, with uh, various IoT parts of Toyota cars and Toyota services, even the entertainment system within Toyota cars. So they're building a really cool blockchain type of environment. And again, they have to address security challenges such as the ones that are written here. I would say that the automated car is a much more complex one compared to the smart home one. Whenever it comes to regulation, uh, each car has several, I would say, uh, ECUs, they call them, uh, mini servers within that have to be protected. And it takes about 10 years to be able to get something into each of these ECU units. So it is happening, it is moving slowly, partly because of regulation. And I think we should all say thank you for them to move slowly in such a cautious manner because none of us would like to drive a car, a car that has been taken over uh, by, I would say, a hacker. Um, so the current status quo as far as IoT blockchain security is, uh, these are the various types. I was very much surprised 
to know that these are still the ones that are uh, protecting most of the IoT devices. It is not surprising in, from where we started the conversation in the sense that many of them don't have secure elements or have very poor processing power. But it is interesting that many of these uh, authentication tools and security tools are pretty much evolutionary wise, the ones that were uh, popular 20 years ago and not much advancement has been done since then. So uh, what are the challenges with current authentication tools? Uh, many of them one can imagine are platform dependent, even though there's a lot more uh, there are many more types of IoT devices compared to, let's say, 20 years ago. Uh, they're manufactured by a, various, uh, by a huge area of vendors. Uh, hi, TCO. We had one customer with which we wanted to work two years ago. And interestingly, that customer said, you know, for me to be able to put, it uh, doesn't matter which key, whether it's MPC key share or a full key, uh, on my old IoT devices that are spread all around that would cost me $2 million because I have to get dedicated teams moving now all around the country to be able to implement those, whatever it is, on those very old IoT devices. So they were very much uh, sorry to say they would not be implementing, not MPC, but nothing else, into taking, I would say, the risk that something would happen and managing that risk because they cannot afford to put uh, any type of security means out there. Uh, so in their case, without this disclosing their names, uh, their name, they're simply managing the risk of something happening. And we all do that on a daily basis. You know, we're not protecting everything with the best, I would say, security means, but we manage the risk for that. Um, resources uh, constrained devices, we've just talked about these types, uh, many of them, actually most of them out there, whether these are weak devices or old devices, and of course, what just we just talked about the fact that they're not security authentication tools, they're very much outdated, have been around for at least 20 years, where the most of the hackers are not even 20 years old, for that matter. Any questions before we move on to MPC? Okay, so uh, going back to this specific slide, so if this is how MPC would work as far as uh, creating a key in a split manner, uh, sharing it between the various uh, signers and using it in its distributed manner, now one can imagine the various use cases. So this is the smart home example, just in one case. We've talked about the smart home example and what could go wrong. But now, can you imagine a situation where each of these devices has a key share? And a key share is the very, I would say, lean and mean type of data, a very small file, uh, just kilobyte size in the sense of uh, uh, sizing. Uh, and uh, it could be put on whatever IoT device that you want to work with, as long as it has like even a mini server with some processing power. Uh, so you can now start imagining what you can do. Um, it is important maybe to emphasize that the minimum authentication that would be required would require at least two key shares. So you would have one key share on the client side, for that matter, the endpoint is an example, the uh, door lock, and one key share on the server side. Now, these could be more key shares, let's say five, but honestly, one would not, you know, if I want to open my home door, I wouldn't want now my, uh, I don't know, life partner or kid to jointly sign such a transaction with me. I just want to open the door, right? So I would authenticate uh, using probably multi-factor or at least two-factor authentication, let's say my fingerprint using a mobile device, and uh, using another key share that would be on the server side, I would be able to open up the door home. Same one can imagine for, let's say, turning on an air conditioner, etc. You know, the, the examples are, are very uh, various. Now, the authentication could be done uh, using two clients for that matter. One could be, let's say, on the mobile device, 
and one could be uh, on, a, on a mobile device such as a phone. So the examples are various as, as far as what you can do with it, but the principle is pretty much the same. Uh, at least one key share on an endpoint, at least one key share on the server side, and as long as you have at least a pair of key shares, you can create these uh, secure boundaries as far as we call it. Any questions up until now? Okay, moving on. This well, this is, is really uh, Jonathan. Um, I'm just curious. Yes. So, you're, are you using SecP two five six K one in Snore signatures? So, are these separate private keys that you're doing like M of N, or are these like how are you combining these split into shares into either a signal signature or validating the multi signature in M of N? So thank you very much for this question. So uh, it, it is in the direction in the sense that there is an encrypted signature behind the scene. Scenes and uh, the various key shares actually decrypt the encrypted signature. So as soon as you reach an M of N decrypted or key material, you can able to release the encrypted or decrypt the encrypted signature. So it's not multi-signature in the sense though of full keys, but actually M of N, exactly as you mentioned, where the M of N have to decrypt uh, the encrypted signature. Okay, so, so there is a private key on the IoT device. And in order to unencrypt, you need an M, M of N from dispersed other keys in order to for that key on that device in order to for it to function and there is stuff. no full there is no full private key there's only a key share uh, the key share would be wrapped by an authentication key which would be a full key but uh, the this is just a full key to wrap the key share but there is no full key as far as the decryption of the encrypted signature in order to let's say approve a transaction or, or sign a message. No, no full key. Whatever the, the phase of the uh, communication is, whether it's a message, with, whether it's a transaction, there is no full key ever. Okay, so is it, but it's Schnorr signatures. Uh, this could be Schnorr signatures, yes. This could be EDDSA, ECDSA, Schnorr. We're pretty much agnostic as to the type of signature that has to be created. We're crypto agile. This is one of the advantages, I think, of having it on a software, meaning, you know, Schnorr is new. I don't think it was two years ago. I'm not sure, but, but we support it now. So we don't know what will be out there in two years from now. Okay. Uh, this is this is more challenging, I would say, for the IoT environment, regardless of Unbound, the fact that this market is moving so fast, you know, uh, you cannot replace IoT devices every two years out there. Okay, uh, Tesla example. This is a real example, the vulnerability one, not the protection one. Uh, so uh, two years ago, there was uh, a relay attack where uh, someone was able to steal a Tesla car, Model S. I'm pretty sure they changed it from now, so I do apologize for the fact that I'm uh, uh, giving Tesla as an example still today, but it is, it, it is a nice anecdote for that matter. Uh, in, at least two years ago, they authenticated uh, the uh, transaction of opening a car using a key that was fully kept on the uh, phone app. It was actually stored in the app's uh, sandbox folder and therefore uh, vulnerable to malware. I'm, I'm pretty sure they have changed it since then, but this was the situation then. I think this is another uh, testimonial of why when this is very, I would say, expensive type of asset and the car is a first such type of asset, one would not want to rely on a full key on the app of the end user. This is the case, by the way, with the uh, self-managed or self-sovereign keys wherever identity is uh, being discussed. Let's say with Hyperledger Indie, just as an example. So this is very useful when you're speaking of, let's say, uh, exposing uh, one's age when you're trying to get into a restaurant or a bar, but I wouldn't want to be able to open a car using a key that would be stored on my device 
in its full state, in its full entity state. But this was the case with the Tesla uh, Model 5 or Model S uh, case a few years ago. Uh, this is, I'll show you now an example of how this situation could have been addressed using MPC. Uh, keys could have been split between the car owner and the server on the Tesla car. We just talked about a few minutes ago the fact that each car today, regardless of runbound, has many ECUs within. So one could leverage one of those ECUs to be able to open up the car where one key share would be on one of those ECUs servers within the car and one would be on the mobile uh, device of an end user and making sure that nothing can happen, let's say if even the device was stolen or has been cloned, just as an example, one would have to use multi-factor authentication, let's say a fingerprint, just as an example, but could be more than that, even an OTP, et cetera, to be able to reach a car or to open a car, sorry. So uh, one can imagine, just even convenience-wise, regardless of the security thing, uh, just you know, reaching the car with my mobile phone uh, and being able to open the car without moving around with a hardware token, for that matter, which is the old-fashioned key that we still all, do, all use in, in one way or another. Um, so this is a great example of how MPC could be leveraged to do that. Uh, home door example, we talked about that. So the key could be split and shared between a mobile app and uh, server side could be on the phone itself. And the uh, home lock door uh, could have a mini server on it. So this is already happening in a few hotels worldwide. So this is really interesting as far as moving around. But one can imagine an entire uh, ecosystem blockchain wise as far as creating let's say complexes of uh, vacations hopefully we'll all start sorry there she goes um, to open doors in in complexes of vacation houses etc and going back to the Toyota example this is becoming more interesting because now we don't talk anymore about one let's say key that is not even there but still being shared between two parties as as we've seen here see you always have this pair with the toyota case we're actually starting to make use of the fact that the key could be distributed between n parties and you need m of n to be able to sign a transaction so one can imagine a toyota let's say consumer a buyer going into one of their uh, dealer houses wanting to buy whatever it is they want to the car and you have the supplier, you have uh, uh, a customer and a dealer on the other side. You want Toyota to be aware of this information without disclosing the, uh, let's say, even the private details of the consumers themselves. And one can imagine the various advantages of such a, a blockchain type of scenario. You can manage better the supply chain. You can manage uh, the amount of equipment that you have uh, moving around the world in different ports and different manufacturing houses. So much more efficiency, so much on demand, I would say, supply to the specific point of, uh, of uh, supply to the end consumers. We have such an example with Walmart, even though it's not uh, an IoT use case, but I think it's a very interesting one because Walmart now buys uh, vegetable and uh, all types of uh, fresh produce from their local uh, retailers, just you know, on, on the tip of supply requirements or demand requirements, I would say. So they don't need to keep tons of tomatoes, just as an example, in warehouses, getting them, you know, uh, less fresh day after day because they can get messages from the super, lo local supermarkets using blockchain to be able to address uh, demand uh, in a much more uh, um, faster manner than before. So with Toyota cars and equipment, this is not, I would say, as sensitive as, as keeping tomatoes as fresh as possible, but one can imagine that the Toyota-related uh, uh, supplies or IoT devices are much more expensive, and therefore they do want to make it much more efficient. Uh, so this is another example. Any questions before we dive into the threat model or maybe we should stop here for discussion? 
Uh, yeah, Jim, I, I ask one quick question. One of the challenges I've worked on Mobi standards, um, which is for the Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative on uh, vehicles, which includes Tesla, Toyota, and all the other stuff. And in there, we were looking at um, uh, security and keys with the challenges of trying to talk about, everybody talks about hardware wallets and so on on the vehicles. The bigger challenge for me has always been, um, I'll call it the practical uh, real world ability to recover keys and access um, when they're corrupted, destroyed, stolen, whatever, compromised. And I don't see anybody really addressing that well. Um, and having experience, it would, you know, to your point about uh, autonomous vehicles, one of the good reasons they're going slow is that many of the scenarios that do exist in the real world are not yet addressed in AV driving uh, scenarios, for sure. The same problem applies to, in a sense, uh, any uh, identity access solution for sure. And I assume there's no difference with multi-party uh, computation key management as well. You still say, okay, if, the, if you have, in a sense, this multi-party key, like you showed in the example for the car, and you say, okay, uh, your phone is now destroyed or the ECU on the car has been destroyed, uh, which is very easy to happen. Um, you know, can you still, in a sense, access the vehicle? Um, and the answer is probably not. And what's the time to recovery? So if you think about recovery models, we talk about RTO and RPO, recovery point, recovery time objectives. And I don't see any of that kind of stuff specified for, in a sense, these types of solutions, which maybe in many IAT cases is not critical, but in certain ones like vehicle access and so on, um, it would be critical for sure. Yes, thank you very much for this question because uh, very fortunate Unbound MPC is addressing those issues uh, with the fact that these key shares are being refreshed constantly and one can suspend or even revoke a key share to be able to generate and uh, enroll another key share, let's say, to another party. So just as an example, if one, actually it, it is, um, shown in the threat model that I'll show you in a minute. Let's say someone loses their phone or their phone is being stolen. So you can suspend or revoke that key share. You can enroll another key share. Let's say if you right. bought a new phone and you want. So yes, yeah, so it is addressed. Um, but I so do the agree. Is, right. If it would be helpful if you took like exactly the car access scenario and said, okay, walk it through a recovery model, which says, okay, the, the, stone, the phone is to your point stolen, so I don't have the phone. What is the recovery time objective that we achieve uh, that we're going for, I should say, um, in that scenario? Is it minutes, hours, days? You know, what is the actual recovery time that you're targeting? Uh so so let me address the the general scenarios general scenario yeah. it's a matter of seconds we we've done so uh even yesterday we had someone in another i would say customer not a car i would say we're not working yet with cars as, as i've mentioned the automotive car is moving slow and and we, i think we should all be thankful for that but uh another customer even yesterday a real life example someone bought a new phone wanting to upgrade a, a um, the app that we're using with them, something went wrong. And it was just a matter of seconds before we simply revoked the old phone and, and enrolled the new phone with, with the new key share. As simple as that. Uh, so this is a very, I would say, easy example. With that specific case, this was a digital asset type of uh, management uh, system. So the time frame is very critical. You cannot have uh, any compromised key share whenever you're trading or safeguarding a million dollars, like even much more expensive, you know, than a Tesla car for that matter. Um, I think that the more concerns uh, when speaking of automotive are actually not so much, you know, stealing the mobile phone, but taking over a car, something like that. So um, I don't know where, how far the industry is, is there as far as taking over an ECU etc. Um, yeah. Um, if, if we could dive into the threat model, I think you'll find some examples you may find value in. Uh, so these are just a few. I'm not covering all those, you know, I showed you in one of the earlier slides about 30 of, of types of attacks. 
So uh, these are the main ones as far as just, you know, for our discussion today. So it could be mobile traffic redirection and network adversary, of course. Uh, very relevant where you're uh, talking about, let's say, traffic jams, traffic lights being messed around, uh, denial of service, of course, uh, side channel attacks and device cloning, which would be the case, let's say, with someone taking over uh, someone's mobile uh, phone in order to open a car if we address this specific example using this specific threat. So when focusing on the network adversary or traffic redirection, uh, using MPCN, and here I do have to go back in the sense of do taking, I would say, uh, pride in the fact that I'm part of Unbound. This is not generic MPC protocols that we're talking about, but actually Unbound solution uh, for uh, these types of uh, challenges. So with Unbound solution, all messages are encrypted uh, there's a unique counter to prevent replay attacks. Uh, an attacker can not learn anything about a message from the mobile phone. If you remember, these are key shares. These are simply data file messages. Nothing really that can be, this, this, is, this is not cryptographic information in the sense that one can steal it and you, you use it in order to do something. They have to break into all mobile devices and all servers. If you remember that uh, Toyota examples with uh, at least five key shares. So one would have to break into all five devices and additional servers at the same second because uh, uh, everything is being encrypted and all the key shares are being refreshed at, uh, after each op operation and after intervals of time. So even in the unlikely event of a device being compromised, nothing can be learned about other devices at the same time. Uh, this is to emphasize that the shares are random between the various parties. It is not just as, an, just as an example, if the entire key is 100, just as an example, these are, and these are five parties, it's not that every party gets 20, 20, 20. Uh, the shares are random, they're being split in a random manner, and after each refresh, every party gets a different random share. Um, so this is to address this type of adversary attack. Uh, device cloning, which is what would be, I would say, more relevant for the uh, car example. Uh, so when you, uh, humans authenticate, it will require uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, with devices that have secure elements such as iOS, we are using the, I, uh, the iOS secure element to be able to store the key share itself. Uh, and the authentication key, of course, uh, that wraps that uh, key share. Uh, the key shares are being refreshed continuously. And if a clone device did carry out an authentication uh, action before the legitimate device, the MPC solution protocols will detect the clone attack and raise a flag. I would like to emphasize here, which is not written down, that Unbound can very easily, and we don't have time today to show you an actual demo, can suspend and revoke uh, a device in, in a matter of seconds once we, or the customer of course, traces an issue and be able to re-enroll another device or the same device if it has been just suspended just in a matter of seconds as well. Uh, Backup-wise, this is something that is not mentioned here, but worth mentioning in light of the former uh, discussion. Thank you again for this question. Uh, backup is also MPC enabled, meaning the backup is being done using key shares. Uh, or two full keys, by the way, RSA keys that could be or should be used together in order to recover assets for that matter or data assets. Um, and this is also a, a unique uh, capability of Unbound, the fact that it's MPC based, publicly verifiable uh, and could be used uh, by the organization itself or even a third party, uh, whether these are, you know, uh, just as an example with the Toyota example, they could use a, a third party consulting company such as KPMG or Accenture to be able to back up the information as a trusted escrow service. Uh, side channel attacks, uh, as we all know them, take advantage of the fact that the same key is being used on the same machine, the same processing uh, chips uh, and, and information such as timing, power consumption, 
electromagnetic even leaks or even sound could be used to uh, uh, create side channel attacks. So with the case of unbound MPC, the fact that these are random shares on the server side and the endpoint side uh, mean that there is no full key to be able to steal or to attack. And again, that sharing refresh takes place every operation, every interval of time. And I think that the last attack that we may want to talk about today is denial of service. So uh, usually denial of service rely on the fact that there is some kind of a proof of work that the IoT device has to do upon enrollment. But with MPC, as we've mentioned, this is the breakthrough. It is done so fast as opposed to, let's say, any type of other operation or uh, certainly uh, uh, MPC, let's say, 10 years ago. So the ver ver verification would be so much faster than the proof of work that would be required in order to create the denial of service. This is unrelated to the fact that usually you would create high availability type of environment uh, server side you know, using different clouds at the same time, uh, creating some sort of redundancy between servers, etc. Uh, automotive industry, a whole different kind of story. You cannot create ECUs or multiple ECUs for each function in the car. Uh, so much more complicated, a real challenge. And I am actually very much um, envious and admiring all the automated people that are working diligently today on these scenarios. Um, so this is just to summarize MPC. I think you got the hang of it as far as what's behind it, what it can do, the use cases it could be used for, um, and that's it as far as uh, I am concerned. Thank you so much for your time. I, I have a couple of uh, questions. I think we have about five. Yes, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is. Uh, obviously, you're talking about some kind of a ratchet protocol or something that uh, refreshes the keys. So that would assume um, connect connectivity, right? I mean, without connectivity, that refresh cannot happen. Exactly. Yes, you are absolutely right. Online uh, connection is required for the refresh. Yes. So coming back to the question of... Um, let us say, um, use of IoT in blockchain. One of the uh, more interesting ones is where you track the provenance or even the progress of uh, material um, and also the uh, temperature or the pressure. Like, for example, you can have an IoT device inside a container that brings some uh, sensitive material, but often this is at sea and it is very difficult to maintain connectivity throughout. So, uh, you know, so obviously there has to be some kind of protocol to, to secure those IIT devices and to be sure that whatever they're sending back is, is good, you know, good data that they can. Yes, absolutely. You, you are absolutely right. When these are offline, uh, servers or endpoints, the refresh becomes a challenge. I would say that it's much better than having no, uh, yeah. I would say, MPC around because the, at, I would say the worst case is actually having a full key that is yeah. not being refreshed <laughs> ever. So it is an advancement, but yes, connectivity would be preferred in order to allow for that refresh to happen. I, I, I would like to address a workaround around that that we are doing with uh, various types of customers of us. Whenever one of the devices would be offline, we do recommend having a policy, we call it, of at least a few devices uh, that would have to take part in in a, in a transaction, some sort of a transaction. We are leveraging trusted systems where some of them are fully cold, therefore not refreshing key shares, and some are hot. And both sides, both systems are required in order to sign a transaction, let's say the cold one and the hot one. This is a much more, I would say, sophisticated use case. I don't see it really happening for IoT devices unless these are very, very, I would say, dangerous ones, let's say trains, just as an example. Uh, but it is possible if, if one would really want to do so. 
And uh, what exactly is your product? Uh, do you sell uh, the libraries or do you sell the full solution? The full solution. Okay, because I had heard that you also allow uh, people to to build something on top of the libraries you provide. Uh, I would yes, I actually, in the sense of, of we do have an MPC library, two-party MPC library open source. Uh, it's in Git. It can be found very easily. Uh, we've spread it around actually as a means to uh, uh, educate, I would say, even the market when we started out five or six years ago people were not very much aware of what MPC is or what it can do. So we simply released the two party MPC out there. Uh, so these are libraries that anyone can leverage. We support whoever wants to use them. Uh, I wouldn't call it a solution. These are simply a uh, very low level type of MPC, two party out there. But you also have another library that is multi-party that is licensable, right? Yes, yes. But not, not, I mean, I'm not talking about a full solution, just that and then you build on top of it uh, to, I mean, um, I think it'd be useful to talk a very little bit on the difference between, uh, let us say, multi-sig, which many people uh, uh, implement and MPC, uh, because that is a striking difference and yes, I don't know if, sorry, if we have the time, I do have a, a great slide specifically for that. If we can just spare uh, two more minutes, I'll find that slide, open it up, and uh, I could show you in just one slide the difference between multi-sig and MPC. Let me just find it. Or we can, you know, continue the. It's okay. It's it's good. Um, you you can you can show it. Uh, you know, we can extend by one or two minutes. Uh, yes. Of course, so, uh, we will re remind you that we are also going to have the presentation of this in uh, of something similar in the capital markets sig because we are uh, talking about uh, high value. Uh, you know transactions go go ahead yes so this is just one slide and i'll finish with that so thank you for the question uh mpc we consider it next gen multi-sig because everyone knows full key type of old-fashioned kind of security means uh this is what hsms do uh very strong for protecting keys uh challenges that with blockchain just safeguarding the key itself is not good enough because one doesn't have to steal the key they simply have to see the key in order to steal the assets so this is pretty much why multi-sig has evolved so there are multiple keys that each and every endpoint or signer is uh, holding actually being uh, required to sign it and being accountable for that on chain the cost of that is the fact that uh, it does not support all ledgers. We just talked about Schnorr. I don't think, I'm not sure if Schnorr is uh, supporting multi-sig. We do know that there are many ledgers that do not support multi-sig. Uh, for example, the point of uh, uh, stake type of uh, assets. Uh, you have very limited quorum uh, structures that you can create up to two out of three. And if you want to create more than two of three, you have to uh, code very sophisticated uh, uh, scripts into that. And there you go into application security type of rules and smart contracts, which are very vulnerable on their own. Uh, it's hard to change approvers. You have to decode them out, code additional signers in, uh, unlike the unbound solution where you simply suspend or revoke and enroll a new type of signer. And of course, if you're dealing with heavily operation cost oriented type of uh, organizations, the fact that you have more and more signers on the same transaction, meaning you're paying higher fees. Uh, with multi-party computation, none of this happens. Uh, specifically with the unbound solution, which is multi-party as opposed to two-party, uh, everything is cryptographically still validated. You have distributed policy enforcement. This is really important. This is not a ser one server validating the policy, but each and every one of the signers is validating the policy. 
any ledger could be supported, no limitation as to the quorum size. We've been talking today uh, a few times about five signers, but we have examples with 10 signers, each of them holding just a key share. Approvers could be updated very easily. You could have offline approvers, as we've talked about, and uh, you could have optional hardware integration so all of this is pretty much why Gartner is saying that MPC is the next gen, next gen security infrastructure. Yeah, the main difference being that the uh, signing takes place outside the ledger. Uh, yes. The other, the, the, in the Baltic case, uh, the signing has to be uh, authenticated by the smart contracts, which can get uh, pretty complicated. Uh, the complication in this my MPC case is outside the ledger. So anyway, uh, it's a very fascinating presentation by uh, Rebecca. Thank you so much for showing up. And uh, I hope you can share at least parts of these slides with us so that we yeah. can uh, put them on the site. Obviously, it will have all your, you know, your, uh, uh, marks on it. Yeah, what you know, we are not going to alter anything. Uh, so that's that's that, and I'll put up the uh, video of your presentation that I have already recorded and the audio as well, and uh, you can use that for other uh, purposes as well. So that's that's all for today. But Rebecca will come back for the capital markets next week. And we can talk about some of the high value uh, institutional type uh, custody or even uh, the other types of custody. But basically uh, it's a slightly different use case, but using IoT devices. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone uh, for taking the time to join. Uh, I know it's not you know obvious, so. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully we'll meet again next week. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.